Uh, okay, guys, uh, I'm trying to do my first podcast on the channel. Uh, we have an Eric uh, from Frings Movement TV. Mm, he has a great channel and I would like uh, him to introduce himself. Mm, so what's up? What's up, man? Thank you for having me, first of all. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's, you know, it's a pleasure to be on a podcast. It's honestly my, I think, second podcast or third uh, to be like uh, the guest on. And I myself um, do the podcast on my channel. And I think it's a great, you know, a great way to um, to know some other people, you know, uh, to get to know some other ideas about certain topics. And uh, I wish we're going to have uh, a great discussion today. Mm, yeah, <coughs> so it's funny because we are f both from Poland, but we, we need to talk in English uh, because we are both doing uh, English content. Uh, but I, ho I hope we, we can do it uh, pretty good so you understand us. Uh, so let's start with um, with you. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me how, how you started uh, calisthenics, how long you've been training, uh, and then tell us more about your channel, what is the, the goal of, of the channel, uh, wh why you create uh, those videos, because I think it's it's probably one of the best, if not the best channel about calisthenics right now, because you go really deep into uh, into important topics that most channels don't don't even touch. So so tell us some, something about. Yeah. That. So first of all, thank you very much. It, I really appreciate these words. Uh, <clears throat> so a little bit like about myself. Uh, I'm so first of all, I'm 20 years old. If someone uh, is not uh, aware. Um, and I started calisthenics training strictly uh, about six years ago, I think. So obviously, so you can tell that I have, you know, six years of bodyweight training experience, of course. And you can probably relate to that. Uh, first years are always, you know, especially when you started uh, not uh, in, let's say, this era when we're like when it's lot like lots of information is available. Uh, when I started, you know, it was mostly about um, just sets and reps, uh, doing uh, lots of uh, pull-ups, push-ups, stuff like that. So I transitioned a bit from like home weight training with dumbbells, you can tell, but I don't count it as my experience uh, in training because it was uh, just, you know, uh, you could call it uh, general physical preparedness or something. So then I started calisthenics. I started uh, developing then my skills, my knowledge, of course. Um, and after a couple of years, I started, uh, you know, noticing that there are certain things that I'm better at um, than than other. And I discovered that, uh, for example, handstand flexibility are probably the things that uh, go pretty, pretty good when it comes to my progression. Other things like, let's say, pulling uh, started stalling pretty quickly. And so this is something that is still present, you know, and I think you can probably relate we are pretty similar uh, in a sense of uh, the skill set that is uh, most uh, that is easiest for us to develop uh, all right so after you know after three years I think uh, it got me to also uh, study uh, physiotherapy uh, and so I'm second year physiotherapy student you can say mm -hmm. Does it, you know, uh, is it somehow related to, to this whole thing? Definitely, yes. Uh, definitely some knowledge regarding anatomy and uh, other stuff or just uh, purely, you know, being interested in certain topics uh, definitely helps, yeah. Um, and so, uh, so this is, um, so these are basically two most important things about me. And after, I think, uh, four years or three years of my training, which was uh, around like two to three years ago, I think, I started um, creating like first content online. So the first uh, piece of content I made, I think, was the muscle up, the ring muscle up tutorial on my older YouTube channel, which is called Frings Beast. I think you can you can still find it. Yes, it's it's still it's. Uh, the muscle up tutorial is still there and I think it's pretty good, but you know, the, 
uh, <laughs> all the other things are not even close to 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 what I wish I had at this uh, at this moment. Then I uh, created my Instagram account and I started sharing uh, my own progress, my own training. I found it to be really motivating, inspiring to you know to know other people uh, that are on a similar journey, on a similar you know um, with the similar interests, hobbies, and I started creating a small community of people who are basically interested in bodyweight training and have similar idea regarding that. So after, I think after one year uh, or something, uh, I discovered you, I think, but I, I don't remember if that was on a YouTube channel or it was uh, maybe some comment in on uh, on certain channel. I don't, I don't remember, but I remember we followed each other on Instagram. So we started having first conversations back then, I think two years ago, maybe. Mm, and so I then I transitioned to more informative content, more uh, based on tutorials, stuff like that. Uh, and one year ago, I started my YouTube channel. Uh, the YouTube channel is something that I want to that, that I put a lot of my time and energy into because um, it's basically a bit different. Uh, it's a bit different concept than most uh, you know most channels, most uh, calisthenics related. Uh, content because I don't talk that much about uh, specifics of how to progress or uh, how to do certain things tutorial wise. Uh, I mostly pick certain ideas, certain bigger, you know, uh, idea, ideas or certain things that I had in my mind from the start of the body with the journey. Uh, like, let's say, uh, if you can assess your level in calisthenics. Uh, or you know the paradox of weighted calisthenics. These were just you know my my thoughts, my ideas, and with some you know with some better editing, something that can be pleasing for an eye. I think uh, I started uh, making more people interested into that, and actually to go you know a bit deeper into into these subjects, which I'm really happy about because honestly, after half year, my results were pretty bad, and I wanted to even you know quit at some point uh, because I thought that uh, in calisthenics it won't be you know it won't work out as well because uh, people in general are less specific are less uh, you know uh, don't want to go as deep into certain subjects but um, it turns out that there are people in this community that uh, are also you know into this stuff which I'm really happy about, and I hope to, you know, to to get that to certain to certain point in the future where we're gonna create some bigger community of people who are actually, you know, um, critical thinkers. Uh, they're interested into, you know, uh, developing the best possible uh, skill set, mind and body wise, uh, when it comes to calisthenics. So uh, that's that's about me, I think. Great man. So um, that's why I. I want to do a podcast with you to to share your your channel uh, with with people so they can check it out because I think you are like uh, Zach, Zach Telander of calisthenics. You, you're becoming uh, this this type of of uh, of channel, and I I really like it. Uh, and I don't want to take an, an uh, credit for it. But I remember when I when we discovered each other, I I send you uh, some some links, some some sources of information, because I I saw that uh, you are a deep thinker. You want to to really uh, improve your knowledge, understanding, and and you want to create a uh, good content like that. And and so it's 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 very good that that you you went this way and and you you're doing a great job. Uh, and uh, I think now we can talk about the the sources of, of information for the for the calisthenics uh, training uh, because this is a problem and that's why we need channels uh, like yours. So um, where where do you learn from? Uh, where where do you take uh, the the concepts, the the ideas, uh, methods? Uh, how do you uh, assess the, the, the information, how, how do you translate it to the calisthenics world? Uh, 
Okay, so it's a great question, and I actually wanted to mention that uh, you definitely can take uh, credit, you know, because uh, you did definitely help me uh, to uh, to develop in a sense, you know, by uh, because uh, I think that's the problem, you know, everyone can be uh, if if you put out the content online, uh, there are a couple of you know uh, types of people, so. We have people who are mostly um, who will mostly um, base or let's say assess the results um, based on the the engagement that this certain piece of content produces. So obviously there are things that are more attracting to people and things that are not. Um, obviously the more controversial, the more you know some new idea you will provide. Uh, the better it is and that's that's really the problem because if you're into this world for a long time you know that there is no magic you know magic formula magic trick magic uh, thing and so when someone does try to you know promote something like that it usually means that uh, it's either not true or it's just you know formulated with uh, in in such a way that uh, it looks like uh, it's some it's some magical magical thing. Uh, that's why we have to be really good and uh, really develop our skills of assessing if something is a good source of information. And so obviously when I start, obviously there are no shortcuts. I would say here you have to spend some time into in this world. You know you have to educate. The more you know, you basically you're gonna. Uh, later on be able to to assess whether something is a good source of information or not but uh, how it works is you basically start listening to many people and eventually you start noticing certain patterns so you start noticing that uh, person a person b person c are talking about certain concept in a very similar way or have very, you know, the differences between them are really like uh, small. And so if you look at, you know, their credentials and stuff like that, they're, you know, they're up there, you know, they're sometimes PhDs, uh, you know, medical doctors, uh, stuff like that. So that's, so credentials are definitely one thing, you know, you, you should look at credentials because they are also important. They are no, not the only thing. And sometimes there they can be, you know, we certainly know the examples in the industries that people with higher degrees uh, are not the best sources of information. Yeah, I know so what you're talking about. Yeah, so it's not so, you know, there is no pattern, but it's definitely some, you know, uh, first thing that you should uh, take a look at. So then you see those like many people with, let's say, with these credentials are talking about certain way. And so you can develop a certain, you know, uh, thinking pattern similar to these people. And then when someone talks like completely different, completely different things about certain topics, uh, then that's, you know, red light that something might be uh, not correct with the information that he's providing. Not to say that you should elim eliminate this person from your, you know, uh, yet, because based on one source of information, you can eliminate anyone. But you should be aware that it might not be, you know, the end all be all. So, uh, so these are basically uh, my ways. But like I said, there are no shortcuts. You have to spend some time, and uh, you know, learning. You have to spend some time listening to the podcast, reading. Um, training yourself, experience, uh, getting experience, and eventually you will just be able to um, to know what is better source or what is not. Yeah, I think for me it's it's similar. The I look at the credentials. Uh, I look uh, uh, if certain people uh, say same stuff or different stuff, and then I I, I compare them to each other um, and also the experience uh, it's it's uh, very important but it's not like uh, the best coach is is the the most uh, skilled one 
of course, but but sometimes it uh, it comes uh, together, sometimes not. Sometimes uh, the person may be uh, not very good in practice, but very good in in theory, in in coaching, uh, right? Or or sometimes uh, there are very good athletes, but they are not uh, great coaches. So, but experience uh, always helps, and I think. Uh, the best coach is is the one that at least has some type of experience, uh, because if, if someone achieved the certain move or or certain certain level, then it's easier for them to communicate to the athlete uh, about this stuff, right? And also, I think um, uh, you have to always um, keep in mind that you might be wrong always challenge your ideas uh, and, and beliefs and don't you, you you can't get emotional about this stuff because most people get very emotional right and i also look uh, how how certain uh, experts uh, conduct themselves online how how they communicate with people because uh, if someone uh, is really childish you know uh, in in a way that they communicate uh, that they uh, respond to the critique then 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 I think something is not right with them and uh, so there's the certain things that uh, we need to keep in mind and also uh, I look at this uh, like in order to connect the dots you have to be exposed to, to enough of, of dots you know you, you need to um, check out this point of view the other point point of view you have to have a little bit experience, uh, so it's it really takes a lot of time to be able to uh, know which source of information uh, is potentially a good one and and which is uh, not. Uh, so it's definitely not easy, especially in calisthenics, uh, because in other in other sports, in other disciplines, we have a lot of good good sources of inf information right now, uh, good books. And in calisthenics, it's uh, really problematic. Um, even though it's, it's it's been many many years that it's quite popular, but it's not really a sport, right? So that's that's one thing. Okay. And 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 when it comes to gymnastics, a lot of it it's it's uh, as you probably know the the tradition, the um, yeah, just. Yeah experience of the coaches uh, and not really that much uh, science yeah the right. stuff that basically worked uh you know many years ago is gonna be promoted now because you know um, the coaches are the same and uh, yeah but i want to you know i want to say uh once uh you mentioned about uh, being emotional and to challenge your your beliefs it's something very difficult because um for example, when I put a video, you know, uh, when I put a video, uh, like, you know, we had this situation a couple of uh, weeks ago, I put out the video where I explained the difference between, uh, where I basically explained the difference between intensity and load, which was uh, when I then checked, you know, I, I read some, you know, um, some books, there was that was just a mistake you know i was explaining relative intensity and uh, so then i had you know two options uh, either to you know because this video you, you have to also you know um you have to know if that this video is purely you know bad information something that people won't benefit from uh or something that you know have just couple of mistakes then then it's it's different but it's very hard you know to do something like uh, like probably like you do for example which is removing your older content if it's not suiting your um current your current uh, beliefs and what you what you currently know that's something that i really respect and it's very difficult because you have this uh, this idea this mindset that you spend some time on it you know you you uh who's gonna tell me you know to to remove that content or to 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 say something different but you have to do it if you want to be you know respected in the long run i think if you want to be you know uh associated with a good source of information in the future you have to be able to you know to say that you made a mistake basically not be emotional about it uh just you know 
we we are all we are all making mistakes. We are all trying to you know be most knowledgeable as we possibly can, and there is no need to you know to get emotionally attached to certain idea or to certain uh, thing, especially when it comes to training. You know, when it comes to diet, of of course there are other factors. Uh, like you know ethics but uh, in training for example I don't see why you know um, of course if someone is creating a certain you know marketing around his style of training or his um, method it's a bit different but uh, yeah definitely so that's another just uh, you know quality that I look uh, just as you uh, when I when I assess if someone you know is just uh, good to listen um, yeah, I just wanted to 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 just yeah. So it's easier for us because we are not really making a lot of money from this, so we can just go and delete our uh, older stuff, and it's yep. all good. But uh, I bet for some people that are are big in 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 certain uh, niche, uh, and let's say they discover that they were wrong about some things, but. They probably not gonna go back and delete a, a bunch of videos or a bunch of programs or ebooks because they they want to keep making money. But there are some people like that uh, uh, that will delete and will change their beliefs. But not not everyone is, is like that, of course. So it, it really depends, and that's that's why I, I really respect people that are, are all about providing good information as a priority and uh, the money and, and the fame and everything comes uh, second right and not and not like just how to how to get uh, most popular how to get most money and and because many people ra rationalize it uh, in their mind like oh I, I just didn't know back then I, I I had good intentions so it doesn't matter it's I I'm just evolving blah 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 uh, I'm showing my journey but I think that uh, we have to be responsible about what we put out to the to the world, to the internet, and uh, I really care about integrity. So I, I just like you. So I want to uh, make sure that my my content is solid. I don't want to um, mislead people. I don't want people to to make the same mistakes uh, as I did. So I really try to always check if if uh, my old stuff needs to be deleted or or changed or. Mm -hmm. or so you do the same and, and, and that's why I, I really like your approach. Yes, you know what, so there's also like the uh, the other side of the coin. So basically uh, you can get into, uh, what uh, what is uh, what is that called? Is that impo uh, imposter syndrome or, uh, you know... Uh, the imposter, the imposter syndrome. Yeah, uh, and also the parallels of analysis. Basically, uh, you know, you can get to, you know, you can try to be too right you know too perfect sometimes and that's when if you're a person that creates content and i definitely and i know that you're probably the same in the sense you know you all you always want to be right you always want to be you know perfectly you know um diligent in the information you're providing and that's great but it can get us you know uh, like us people like that uh, to the point where we are not creating any content because we are basically afraid that something that we tell is not 100% right. And so what I do is basically I assess when I look at my video like from the past or my post from the past and I see, you know, it's uh, let's say 85, 90% information is, you know, it's the, the video is still going to be helpful, you know, to a person and it's still, you know, mostly good. But there are certain, let's say, names. You know, I use the word, let's say, loaded mobility. Uh, I, I'm not talking about my Instagram post right now from a couple of th this one. I'm gonna probably remove. But um, the uh, the video about my uh, flexibility. You know, of course, I provided some information that uh, probably uh, I would not do. I would not provide right now. But I still think, you know, 90%, you know, regarding the methods, the uh, ways to develop flexibility is still present. If in the future it happens that, you know, these methods or certain things are total BS, then I'm going to remove it, you know. Then, then I'm going to have to, you know, take a step and say, you know, this information is just, you know, harmful for people. It creates more harm than good. 
So I'm going to have to, you know, but I think that's also uh, something that you have, uh, you know, issues with. Basically, uh, you're trying to be always as right as possible and it gets to the level of perfection, you know, um, and it can be stressful also. But uh, yeah, so you probably can relate. Yes, of, of course, because I am the, the perfectionist. Uh... I, I always try to do the, the best I can and uh, the more I, I learn, the more I realize that I don't know that, that much and uh, that's that's why I, I haven't been producing much content lately because every day I I learn something new, I, I rethink, rethink certain uh, stuff, certain beliefs and I got a little bit paralyzed uh, recently. Mm. But uh, I think I, I'm going in, in the right direction because even even when I'm not creating content, I at least I I get some ideas for the new one. I I recently I changed some stuff uh, uh, when it comes to to old uh, old content on the Instagram, for example, the the word mobility. Yeah, I I learned that the the word mobility may not be the the best. A way to explain um, what I uh, what uh, I am about. So I I changed it to flexibility, um, and I, I had to remove certain posts, uh, change uh, change the wording in certain places uh, on my social media and stuff. But um, I think it's it's important. I think that words matter, and and we need to uh, keep that in mind and and to communicate the best as as we can because. If we don't have a, a definitions uh, of a certain uh, words, then it's 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 really hard to to communicate, right? To communicate, yeah. Mm. On at least you know a bit higher level than than usual conversation, you know. Yeah, so and I definitely agree. Yeah. Mm. So uh, another another uh, excuse why I'm not making content because I really hate editing and and stuff like that, but. One day I, I need to really really uh, go into it because I, I like um, I like how your videos are, are made uh, because it really helps to um, how do I say it to visualize certain concepts yeah, and to and to um, engage more people right yeah, yeah for me for me I don't really care if if someone just makes a video on their phone and, and talk about stuff because I'm mm -hmm. really uh, interested uh, and I don't I don't need this this all this fancy stuff but I know if you want to reach more people and, and if you want to uh, do do something more with, with your content then you have to eventually step up, step up your editing game right and and not only editing but the filming and audio and all this all this stuff but uh, in the end uh, it's probably better to do low low quality content with good information then then don't create content at all so oh yeah i definitely agree 100%. so so maybe i will uh, uh, create some low quality content but with good information and we'll see in the future okay, uh, okay i think we can change uh, topics uh, now because we've been talking for for a long time about this more philosophical Stuff. Let's get more practical. Uh, let's talk more more calisthenics. Uh, the I think we can we can touch on the the stuff that that we um, talked before we started recording. So about the um, uh, the order of the exercises and and if 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 you pair the exercises uh, in the workout uh, or not. If you do. Uh, only pull exercises or only push exercises or both pull and push in the same workout mm, because basically there's uh, three ways when let's let's say uh, upper body training uh, to to specify there are three main ways that you can uh, create your your uh, spread, uh, session spread the exercises yeah, yeah. Uh, so either you can do a pull uh, or push session where, where you have all your pull movements uh, one after uh, another just straight sets 
first movement, second movement, and it's it's uh, first way. The the second way is you have both pull and push in the same workout, but you you do pull, then you do push, then pull, then push, uh, and you also uh, can pair the exercise. It's very popular because uh, you can save time uh, this way. You do pull, rest a little bit, push. Uh, rest a little bit and then back to the first pull exercise and you do until you com complete all the all the sets so uh, now tell uh, tell us uh, your experience with all of those mm -hmm. three if you if you tried all the all, all three methods and and how do you feel about it um, yeah, so I did try actually uh, all of them, you know, uh, but recently, so for, um, all, all right, let's, so let's start with, you know, with the past. So I started with uh, mostly push-pull uh, kind of splits, or it was like push-pull lower body or something like that. But um, basically in a session I was doing, you know, exercise one, doing all my sets, uh, rest, doing like rest between sets normal like three minutes rest another exercise so this was just an order so that was the first method right my experience with that uh well so i cannot honestly i cannot tell anything you know either very good or very bad about this uh, particular way of spreading exercises it just seemed to be you know logical because you have uh, as the sets go, you know, you, you develop certain um, patterns, certain, you know, you, you, you get more uh, maybe the uh, the movement gets a bit more efficient. With yeah, you get into set. the groove, right? You get to the groove, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the move gets a bit more, you know, efficient as you, uh, as you go. Also, another exercise, you're more, like, more fired. Uh, so it's probably going to be also a bit better in terms of like things like probably uh, mu uh, muscle connection. Uh, so in terms of, you know, uh, just uh, purely uh, efficiency, feeling of movement, I would say it's a really good method because you just have straight order of exercises. You're doing them one after another, set after the set, and nothing is interrupting you. Now, uh, later on, I switched to the upper uh, upper lower split, where I was basically doing uh, exercises in exactly same way, but I was alternating uh, between pushing and pulling. So I was doing first exercise, which was, for example, weighted, weighted chin-ups, you know, and it was the pulling exercise. I was doing all my sets, then I was switching to the handstand push-ups. Usually the other way around, but uh, yeah, what I found was uh, that uh, exercises in the same plane uh, or, you know, in the same range of motion of the shoulder really correlate with each other positively in terms of like handstand push-ups was really uh, making or chin-ups for making my handstand push-ups better, uh, but you know, I don't know if you could not get these benefits only with some sort of warm up, you know, uh, I cannot tell that. So this was something that I was doing not very, so not for a very long time. And for the last couple of years, I've been doing the last method, which is basically alternating exercises. So there are a couple of benefits of, of that, you know, first of all, you get uh, less time in the gym, you get more done in the less uh, so what you mentioned already uh, and also another benefit is that you know potential benefit is that you rest more between um, the the exercises so you have pull-ups you rest for let's say two minutes then you do exercise uh, like I don't know handstand push-ups you rest for another two minutes and then you repeat uh, the exercise again so you get more rest and you get more done but of course nothing is you know magical there cannot be a way to you know go around everything and so the potential downside is that um, 
you get a bit misgrooved, like you mentioned, like uh, when we talk about uh, like off camera, you get a bit misgrooved, you know, and uh, you might, you know, not be as activated as, you know, focused on the same exercise when you alternate, uh, when, when you're alternating. So uh, if you have some other experience, because you, I know you plan to, you know, switch right now to the push pull. And uh, so what are the reasons uh, for that? Did you find to be, you know, less uh, productive this way or? Yeah. Mm, I think we, we need to go with pros, pros and cons of, of each one because it all depends on, uh, on the person or of the time av av availability and uh, the goals and uh, if, you, if you train for hypertrophy or, or strength. So, uh, I want to switch now because uh, most of my uh, life I train uh, upper body um, with pull and push in the same workout and uh, it was uh, usually paired exercises so uh, pull ups rest handstand push ups rest pull ups so it's it's good because you as you said you you have uh, you have, uh, how do I say it? You you waste uh, less time. Uh, yeah. On the workout, but you're more, uh, yeah, you're more, more efficient, efficient with your time. Time, yeah. Yeah, with, you're more efficient, but you are getting possibly you are getting mis misgrooved because you you start to uh, feeling the pull-ups and then you have to do hands and push-ups yeah. and then back to pull-ups, right? So. That's why I want to switch now to to see if if it would really be um, better f for me to to get into the groove of the pulling exercise, first pulling exercise, uh, and just each set should should be a little bit better because your nervous system uh, system adapts to the exercise. You're getting good feeling for the movement, and then when you do uh, next pull exercise you're already already warm up uh, already feeling the feeling it and you don't have to um, really warm up that much for the next one uh, and the session uh, each session will be shorter because you have less exercises now uh, with both push and pull um, you have to do for example three exercises usually or four for pull and for push, so you have eight exercises. But with pull and push, you have the um, potential to make the sessions shorter, and it may be uh, a good thing. It may be beneficial to to keep the sessions shorter because if your sessions get too long, you are losing your focus and you are getting uh, tired. And uh, so it may be may be a good thing, but. Um, when it comes to downsides of, of a pull push, uh, uh, you, we have to take in the, into consideration that now um, I I would need to do four sessions uh, in a week, uh, pull push, pull push, to get the the similar amount of work uh, as before when I just needed two sessions, right? Because I could pair the exercises and just get it done in two sessions, but um, if you have uh, upper body session with both push and pull, then um, there's only so much exercises that you can uh, you can fit there. Uh, even though you're you're saving time, but still you can just uh, go with ten exercises because there's no point you you will be doing junk volume. So yeah, and also you know, and also two times a week is probably going to be more you know optimal. Uh, in terms of both, you know, muscle size and strength development, right? Then if you would try to fit that into one session. Yeah, but uh, but I was comparing pull push, uh, pull push. So yeah, uh, to upper body two times a week. So yes, yes, and that's what I mean basically that you need to do push session twice, you know, and pull yeah. session twice. Yeah. Uh, to do uh, to get that frequency, you know, benefits of yes. this. So. Uh, now with pull and push, I can, in a whole week, I can do more uh, pull exercises and more push exercises. Uh, as long, of course, uh, as I, I will be able to recover from it. Because mm -hmm. with two upper body sessions, you have upper body session, you, you have two, three days of rest and, and another one, your recovery should be good. But with pull push, you have to do 
uh, or push pull whatever uh, you have to do first session and uh, another upper body session uh, the, ne- the next day right mm-hmm. even though it's different session because you did uh, last time you did push now with the pull there still may be some uh, how do i say it they basically will you know uh, affect each other right affect each other yeah so this is something uh, that i i'm a little bit uh, afraid of that even though i, I will be using uh, different movement patterns different muscles that there, there's still stabi- stabilizers involved so when i do pull session i might um, fatigue my lats for the push push uh, session when i need to stabilize uh, my hands and push ups yeah. with with lats right so this may be a potential problem, but uh, other than that, um, I think it may be really, really good thing to to get into the groove, you know, to to do more of the uh, of the pull exercises and push exercises in a week compared to before, um, and to to change uh, my approach uh, because there's also this this. Uh, Psych- psychological benefits when you do something uh, different after a long time of the oh, doing yeah. sa- same stuff, right? So this this may be really important too. And uh, I think Bert just went into into my window. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so the 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 pros and cons to 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 wrap it up because i i've been ranting too much um push and pull mm-hmm. i think the 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 pros is that you can do more um, exercises in the week get into better groove uh, and session may be potentially shorter mm-hmm. even though we do more because you do four, four four upper body sessions compared to two but the session itself will be shorter so that's the pros and 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 the cons uh, maybe that your recovery may be uh, worse and you you might end up uh, with less time in the week right even though sessions yeah. are shorter but overall you you will be training more so that's for the push pull now maybe you uh, can talk about the pros and cons of, of upper body without pairing sets Okay, so um, in terms of so doing, you know, one exercise, so then so push exercise, then pull exercise, right? Uh, yeah. So I think what really matters, you know, in this kind of split is to is the exercise order, uh, because there are certain um, exercises that will, you know, will affect the other more than uh, the other way around, right? So for example. Just like, you know, in, for example, in powerlifting, most people agree that deadlift is going to, you know, interfere more with, um, I mean, it's going to affect, you know, negatively squat more than doing squat first and then deadlift, you know, because deadlift is just more taxing um, in generally, like the uh, system wise. Uh, In calisthenics, I would say that there are definitely exercises that you should, uh, you know, put like later on. Uh, so if you have some exercise that requires lots of like um, tech technique, I mean mostly handstand, you know, handstand push-ups, for example, I would put it first, uh, you know, after certain warm-up sets because you need lots of that stabilizing muscles, like you said. Yeah. Um, and for example, doing handstand push-ups at the end of the session, you know, even even though you know making them. M- even though making them uh, significantly less intense will not be as optimal, I would say. Uh, handstand push-ups, you probably know how handstand push-ups feel at the end, you know, after pull-ups, for example. Yeah. So your your forearms, you know, are fatigued, so you cannot balance uh, as properly. Uh, yes, yeah, so the exercise order is definitely a big thing, you know, and so it doesn't have to be disadvantage. It does not have to be if you, uh, if you just correctly going to, you know, spread these exercises. But in terms of like to get a bit of, you know, uh, guideline or to, to, to give the idea. So the first, uh, so the first con 
is that you're not going to be able to prioritize. You know, uh, I would say at least both, uh, like many exercises, both push and pull. Uh, because if you start from the exercise, you're doing five sets, it will definitely affect the other exercise. Um, so that's the con, definitely. The pro is that uh, even though you get the benefits of, you know, this uh, groove, so you get the exercise done, each set is better and your frequency, you still don't have to train four times a week. You can do, you know, upper body session two times a week. Uh, so it might be a bit longer, but you're going to have more time, you know, to recover and you're going to have less time spent in the gym overly. And you're going to get that frequency to two times a week, which is going to be optimal from most standpoints. And yeah. you won't have sorry, to be sorry, doing... Sorry to interrupt, but... The, the word optimal is is yeah, maybe yeah, not, I know. I not the best word because yeah, yeah. recently I've been I've been uh, it's verbal medicine he, yeah I've been hearing from Austin that, that, that they didn't like this word and maybe it's not the best way to to communicate this but I know what you mean okay so, yeah, yeah yeah sorry uh it means like from the standpoint of, of hypertrophy uh, and uh, most yeah, on, you on know, average it's 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 the best idea to train two times a week average, right yeah yeah, yeah. so. Yeah, I also agree on that on that word, and I actually was, you know, maybe the this podcast thing, you know, made me uh, lose my mind a bit and not focus on this stuff. But I agree, you know, uh, and I also listened to this podcast. Um, so yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, coming back, uh, the so so you got this two times a week. Um, in uh, in uh, for you, you you need only two times a week to you know to get the the same results as you would do four times with push pull in terms of frequency. Uh, so yeah, so that's benefit. So you need less time, you need less frequency. Mm, but like I said, I would not, um, or maybe it's not that I would not choose this one. But um, I just it just depends on the exercises that you choose. If you have lots of technical movements, then it might not be you know best idea. Mm, on the other hand, if you got lots of movements that are purely you know strength more strength based, just the more strength based like weighted pull ups, weighted dips, it's totally fine to do them you know just one after another. So I don't see the point, for example, of supersetting weighted dips and weighted uh, chin-ups. So it, it can be pr pretty much done weighted chin-ups than weighted dips. And you're going to get more benefits, I think, in this yeah. way. You're going to you know get better in pull-ups as you go in the sets. Same with dips. Um, so yeah. Do you have some other thoughts on this type of... Uh... Uh, yeah, yes. I, I think that um, there, there's something you know about... Uh, the pull push uh, stuff because then you can for example create a session uh, just with the one goal like this is a, a front lever session or this is a one or chin up session uh, some people train like that <coughs> uh, i don't okay. think that there's necessarily a need to create session just for one one goal one movement but then you have this this uh, benefit when you can really focus on on one thing uh, with no distractions and with the the upper body when you have both pull and push then it's it's really lack this this element that, that you can really focus on one thing so that's definitely a con for for some people mm -hmm. because i know a lot of people like to create uh, like this is the, my planche session this is my front lever session and yeah. i do everything for for this movement so you have one main movement with full focus and then you uh, choose exercises to to help with that movement right and that's yeah, it so that might be a con of this approach um, <clears throat> and uh, definitely it makes a difference if you train for hypertrophy or for for strength or, or for skill develop development because yeah it it matters uh, the least for the hypertrophy right because then you can to pull or, or push or or you can do both uh, or you can do pair, se pair sets and uh, it it will it still it still matters of course um, but it probably matters the, the the least and for the strength then we have to think a little bit more about it and for the 
uh, exercises with skill component, with balance, uh, with, uh, with exercises that are really technical, that it really, really makes a difference Even how do more. you, yeah. it, how it do you sequence exercise, uh, which exercise is first and how exercise affect uh, each other, right? So uh, let's just uh, quickly talk about pair, paired sets a little bit, mm -hmm. maybe, so we can say something. Yeah, so first sets are definitely the ones that are can most comfortably talk about because I have a full experience with that and I've been actually doing it myself, you know. Um, you know, I'm at the similar period to you because uh, currently during, you know, exam uh, season and I just um, don't have this energy focus and, I'm, and so I'm pro probably doing the same thing as you, so I'm resting and, you know, I'm just waiting for the next training cycle. And I'm going to be, you know, writing it down uh, pretty soon. And so I think about all this stuff because I may also switch to something different to just, you know, get that refreshing benefit, like you mentioned. But uh, up to this point, I've been doing the PERT uh, exercises. And so I think that, um, first of all, psychologically, it's a bit, you know, um, for example, it, it's an advantage to me psychologically because when I have two exercises and it's pretty weird i i don't know i don't know even if other people have this kind of you know mindset but uh, i feel when i work on for example hands and push up and weighted pull ups then uh, my mood and my you know uh, how i feel during this session is not only affected by one exercise so for example my hands and push up may suck this day but pull ups be good and it's still going to be considered a good session for me and it matters because it it you know it helps with your motivation to 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 you to go farther into a session and then further into a training week so it definitely matters but it's you know uh, it's only psychological uh, <clears throat> i think that the main uh, the main benefit that i found is that uh, even though you're doing you know you're actually spending less time on the exercises you rest between particular particular movement, you rest more. Of course, it's not a total rest. It's not like you rest six minutes doing nothing because at the same time you're doing, you know, you're training your antagonistic muscles and probably agonists as well, but in, in a form of sta stabilization. But um, I find, you know, I found uh, that, for example, handstand push-up combination and weighted pull-up works just fine you know and it gets very hard after a couple of sets after let's say three four sets it gets pretty difficult uh but it's still you know these three sets are very efficient in my eyes with both pulling and pushing uh of course i don't know if i get ever you know as productive in terms of technique on the handstand push-ups for example because maybe i take too much you know time between maybe the pull-ups you know interfere with my hands and push-ups ability it it is you know it is possible um but um then i can you know so i can do more exercises in a session you know i can do i can rest more after this session and i spend more time uh resting between single movements so these are the benefits i found and I like this style, honestly, I enjoy it, but it's pretty, you know, but there are arguments to switch to other types. Uh, so now I'm going to probably get back to uh, the goal of uh, one arm chin up, probably. Uh, and so I'm going to work on one arm chin up and planche. And so now you got to think about it because, you know, in planche, for example, uh, just like, you know, front lever and planche are totally opposite. In with it in what I'm chin up, you got the bicep, you know, in planche, you get the bicep as well in a different form. You're gonna be more careful, you gotta be more careful a bit with recovery. Um, so yeah, so uh, but overly, I like this system, I like this way of spreading exercises. Yeah, I, I like it too because that's how I train most of my, of my life, really. And uh, I don't think it's it's such a big deal, but if you uh, really want uh, quote unquote optimal, uh, I think it's it's gonna be a little bit better to really get into the groove and, and, and focus more because even um, 
between sets. For example, you do a handstand push up in a set, and then you can just fully rest and just think about next set what will what you can do better. Really, um, really focus and, and think about it. But when you have patch sets, then you you finish your handstand push ups. You are resting, but now you you need to prepare for the pulling movement uh, and focus on that. And then you're resting, but you need to go back to handstand push up. It's it may be not it may be not a big deal, but there's definitely something to it. It's so pretty, I, I it's I pretty nuanced. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. nuanced and probably also individual because lots of it will depend on, like I said, uh, the psychological factors, you know, and stuff that you're just used to, but. It definitely is, you know, a good thing to talk about it because there are some differences. Yeah, and as I said before, it's it's gonna uh, matter more for the technical stuff like handstand push-up than for hypertrophy because uh, when you train for hypertrophy, most of the time you you are not doing unstable exercises, right? If you're doing it right, so you don't have to really care about that much uh, about your balance or, or your technique yeah so but for calisthenics uh, when it comes uh, to even to frequency right we have to not only take into consideration the the muscles but uh, connective tissue because um, when you compare uh, typical hypertrophy training you, you are choosing exercises that will give you um, the best uh, stimulus to fat, fatigue ratio right so so to really you want to really focus on the muscle and you want to avoid uh, connective tissue uh, damage right so you can you have a lot of exercise to choose choose from and you can find the best uh, one for for yourself there, there's no exercise that you have to do but when you train uh, calisthenics you can just choose yeah. uh, exercises uh, ha uh, how you want because if you want to train planche you have to train planche and, and that's it so so then you have to think okay the the planche training will affect my uh, connective tissue in this way and uh, i need certain uh, time to recover and i have other exercises that will also uh, affect the, the same uh, same joint same uh, same tissue so uh, you really can't do as much frequency when, when it comes to calisthenics uh, compared to hypertrophy training. Yeah, because okay. you are getting more more uh, damage, right? Yeah, and I have one analogy. You know, uh, uh, you know, like uh, in terms of this uh, stimulus to fatigue ratio. So there are two examples. For example, you can do lateral raises, you know, with straight arms and with a little bent elbows. And in terms of, you know, for hypertrophy, you're going to choose the bent elbow one because it's going to have yeah. better stimulus to a fatigue ratio. You know, that's something that you told me about. It makes total sense. Um, and so, for example, here you don't have to, you know, there is no, you know, you, you don't have to do on straight arms because uh, it doesn't just matter for the hypertrophy. Yeah. Um, but you can't do bent, or bent elbow planche, you know, uh, just to get you know more uh volume in or yeah better stimulus to fatigue because you're not specific then uh to to the plunge so you're yeah, not gonna I, you know develop your plunge i i mean you can but as as uh, you, you, yeah a accessory movement but most most of the time you have to be specific and most of the time you have yeah, to train I'm talking staying. basically you need yeah. straight arm strength to yeah some straight arm strength right so you cannot you know just totally not do it but yeah but bent arm strength for example bent arm is a good way to you know work around that so like you mentioned the connective tissue strain basically we mean you know we mean the elbow you know you mean we mean the bicep uh, tendons which are going to be wrists. Very, wrists yeah which are going to be uh, very uh aggravated during for example plunge so there's a couple of things you can do about it so for example you may do your main planche exercise, you know, in a, in a total, like the most specific way. So on, on the floor, for example, and with uh, straight arms, like normal planche. Um, and then as you go, you know, with exercises or other movements that, you, that will complement that, you may use, for example, uh, you may use bent arm planche. You may, you, you may use, you know, uh, lean push-ups, pseudo planche push lean push-ups whatever you call them um and you can also do them on parallels to give less strain on the wrists 
So there are ways, you know, to work a bit around that, but you have to de definitely, you know, take uh, take that into consideration. Like you mentioned, the connective tissue strain, you know, the S, this, uh, you know, stress recovery adaptation yeah. uh, like curve is going to be longer for certain movements than for others. Uh, so uh, yes, so you cannot expect to train, you know, your planche, for example, every single day. Uh, because it's just not gonna, it, it's just not gonna work. <laughs> and, and that's why we we only talked about uh, pull, push, pull, push, so four times a week or upper body two times a week. Because for calisthenics, it's rarely possible to train three times a week uh, because of the connective tissue strain, right? Even though it would be good for the technical uh, develop, development, for skill development, the, the frequency frequency is important, but. Um, we have this uh, we have this problem with connective tissue uh, and and how exercises uh, affect each other because um, there are a lot of a lot of exercises in calisthenics that are um, that similarly strain your connective tissue right even though they, they may be uh, different in terms that one is push another is pull it's it's still um, yeah. overlaps so uh, that's why we only talked about uh, two times uh, frequency when it comes to pull and push exercises. But of course you can train three times a week or four times a week, but most of the time, eventually you will just <laughs> fall into pieces, basically. Yeah, so, I experienced it myself, you know, I've been trying to do super high frequency, you know, I've been trying to work around it. So for example, do more, you know, uh, flexibility and handstand training, you know, one day, uh, light pulling, but, uh, it usually comes down to me not being able to recover from sessions when I train three times a week. Uh, and it's not only about like, it's not only about volume. So it's not only about spreading out the volume because uh, some exercises are just more strenuous for uh, connective tissue. And I, and I was listening to this podcast lately, you know, um, on Re Revive Stronger. Um, I don't remember who uh, who was the guest, like apart from Mike, uh, from Dr. Mike Israel, but they were basically talking about this frequency and how higher frequency, you know, even though when the volume is spread, we don't know 100%, but it potentially is will be anyways more stressful to the connective tissue, which in hypertrophy yeah. is not as big of a deal, but in calisthenics definitely. For sure. And another, another thing in calisthenics, not only this connective tissue stuff, but also we have to take into consideration how how much uh, focus you need for for some exercises, um, and it really takes takes away from from, from you. It's not like uh, for in hypertrophy training uh, when you have uh, you try to find simple movements and you can really overload that you can be stable. Um, and you can do more of it in, in a week, you can have more frequency, but when you have uh, things like hands and push-ups uh, or, or planche or front lever, when, when there's a lot of technique to it, a lot of uh, focus required, a lot of uh, balance, uh, you know, stabili stabilizers and, and stuff like that, it's it's another thing that you have to take into consideration. You you might not be aware of it, you might not feel it, but, but there's definitely uh, something to it when it comes to recovery. Some exercise just, you need a lot of this, this, this focus and this drive, you have to this, this, this oomph, you know, you yeah. have to be ready to do it. So I agree. It's, it's different. Uh, okay, so I think we can, uh, to not make, his, uh, make this podcast too long, I think we can also touch uh, on the bender and strain arm uh, stuff. Uh, uh, maybe um, the, uh, ratio, right? Bend arm to straight arm. How do you, how do you uh, see it? How do you uh, do it yourself or for your for your clients? Um, and uh, the the bend arm and straight arm uh, split also. It it has been popular in the past, but now I I think mm, most people don't don't train like that. So we can also talk about it a little bit. Yeah, it's you know it's it's an interesting. It's interesting concept, uh, but uh, like everything, it's going to have its downsides. So uh, first of all, let's touch upon, you know, the straight arm, bent arm. So 
You know, unfortunately, I cannot generalize because it's going to completely matter on the goals of a person, on the objectives. Some people, for example, I, um, I, you know, I had a client who, uh, whose goal is, you know, only, uh, only getting better at handstand push-ups. That was his only objective. So in this case, do we really have to do any straight arm work? I would argue not, you know, if you want to develop someone's overall calisthenic strength and that in the future he might be, you know, basically to develop his overall skill set, general, you know, face or something like that, it might be a point of concern, you know, to, to introduce certain uh, patterns from the very beginning. And then, and probably that's how gymnasts are trained, you know, they start from like very, very general big box of uh, exercises. You know, they're just exposed to different stimulus, um, to different kinds of, you know, stimulus. And then they choose their path of uh, spe specialization. But in calisthenics, as we are doing that for fun, mostly, as we are doing that to get the particular thing that we want, you know, then I would not say that it's necessary to train anything. There's no like, uh, unless you go, you know, to compete, or something like that you just train what you what you want to get you want to be specific uh now if someone has the straight arm purely straight arm uh goals and you know very popular objectives front lever and planche right many people do have this combination um uh, the most popular in the calisthenics world to just work you know on the front lever and planche so um what I do is um, one, usually one straight arm exercise, like, uh, you know, for the uh, from the beginning. So I'm a fan of eccentrics, for example, uh, in terms of like uh, handstand to, neg to planche negatives. I really like this exercise because it took me far, I think, with my planche progress. But I'm aware not everyone is able to do it because it requires handstand, you know. Um, in one arm chin up, for example, it requires basic strength to do a negative. You can do with pinky, you can do, yeah, but uh, this is the other story. Uh, so if the person cannot do that, you know, I'm going to go for some exercise like l sit to plunge. It's going to be straight arm purely. Yeah, I'm going to start with straight arm. Uh, as, you know, the session is going... Uh, in the like um, in the time, then I'm gonna use probably different uh, different movements that are gonna be still specific to this uh, to this goal. So in terms of planche, um, I'm gonna usually go for some things like I don't know maybe uh, planche lean presses or something like that, uh, or even you know planche leans. So you but in a dynamic fashion. So you you lean, you get back, you lean, you get back. Uh, and I found that usually, uh, or some statics with bands, for example, but usually that's it. You know, usually people, uh, if they're worked, you know, for many sets on these two exercises, it's usually it for the straight arm. I found it to be really taxing, you know, yeah. and really hard to push, for example. And so that's my concern on the straight arm bent arm. Uh, I just cannot imagine, you know, to do, for example, four exercises uh, purely straight arm uh, based. I don't know. It, it, it's, you know, it's only my, you know, anecdotal uh, evidence, but I think that it's just not possible to do, uh, for example, 12 or 16 sets, you know, straight arm exercise. Uh, I don't know if that's your experience uh, as well. Uh, but at least in a planche, for example, it's it's just not visible. Yeah, I, I think uh, when it comes to bend arm, straight arm split that has been popular in the past, probably not not right now. The the main thing is that there's a lot of uh, bend arm exercises, uh, very general exercises or specific exercises that uh, you can do that are useful and that uh, are not that uh, stressful. Uh, and this is your your base basically, but when it comes to straight arm, there's really not that much uh, not that much goals 
uh, strain on goals and not that much uh, exercises it, uh, itself. So I think there's really no point to separate Bernard and strainer into um, different sessions because but in, you have so much to do on the Bender uh, day that it may be too much, but on a straight down, you, you really can do like four exercises maybe, and that's it. And then that's, you, my, point. that's my point. That's what, that was exactly. Yeah. So so I think always generally uh, the take the priority, even when your when your goal is is purely straight down strain. Uh, I think uh, still bend arm uh, strength. Uh, matters more yeah. because you can just uh, get there by training only straight arm. It should be like uh, uh, less priority. Not that it's it's not important, but just as you said, you can do uh, as much of it. That That's one thing. And the other thing, it's just not a good way to, to develop your, uh, your, your strength or, or muscle by doing straight arm stuff. It, it's more it's more uh, technical, it's more isometric uh, strength. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think bend arm always should be a priority and, and um, always that there should be more bend arm exercise. So basically we can uh, forget about bend arm straight arm split, I, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't like this split, honestly. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not a fan. Maybe, you know, maybe there are certain variations, you know, maybe uh, straight on focus or something like that maybe it might work so for example you're doing you know mainly straight arm but you do uh, accessories with bent arms and this is something that you call straight arm day maybe certain variations but just purely straight arm bent arm is just not you know like you said on bent arm you're gonna have too many exercises on straight arm you're not gonna be able to have as much yeah yeah it's it's not always uh like when when something it's called pull or, or straight arm it's not like it, it has to be only straight arm or only pull yeah. because some people have pull session and they do triceps at the end or some people have straight arm session and then do bend arm just like you said but generally uh, even even in this way the still the bend arm session will affect the straight arm uh, session and and uh, vis, 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 uh, vice versa vice versa right <laughs> so so I don't think there's a need to it because you can. Uh, I like uh, I like this way. I like to do uh, bend arm uh, as a priority in a session, and then straight arm uh, as a secondary exercise. That it's just like lighter variation, like uh, mm -hmm. right. And then on the other session, I like to prioritize straight arm and then bend arm as as uh, something. Oh easier. yeah. So that's that's what I've been talking about, you know, in terms of variation. So, for example, but it's then it's not straight arm bent arm split, yeah. but straight arm focus, bent arm focus, you know. So on one day you're gonna train your handstand push-ups or your ninth degree like uh, more intensely. You're gonna you know start from it, and uh, in terms of planche, it's gonna be just planche lean or some you know something like that, less intense. And on the other day, you're going to start with planche eccentric, something very intense. And on the bend arm is going to be uh, lean push-ups. Yeah. So then it might work. Yeah. Yeah, because I would rather do um, hard straight arm uh, exercise on one day and the lighter exercise uh, on the other day than do hard straight arm exercise and then lighter straight arm exercise in the same session. I, I would rather spread it out uh, so I have the frequency of two times a week uh, and one day I train it harder and one day I train it uh, lighter and uh, maybe it's, it's uh, also better for, for recovery, maybe not, I don't know, depends of course. So um, It depends, yeah. but I totally agree, you know, I'm not, like I mentioned, I'm not a fan and there are better ways to split it out. Yeah. So I, I had something in mind, but I don't know if I can uh, remember. You, you wanted to talk about RPE in calisthenics. Yeah, but um, I think it might be uh, too much for, for today. But mm -hmm. I, I had something more connected to, to the stuff that we talked uh, uh, now. Uh, I know. So um, there's also this popular idea right now that uh, that you don't really have to train straight arm exercises like at all or, or very very little right 
so that you can uh, get the benefit from doing uh, burner exercises and maybe adding the, the, the pauses or, or stuff like that. But for me, I think that um, the problem of this approach is that uh, if you want to do uh, tuck punch push-ups, push for example, it's it's pretty easy to develop the bend arm strength for it compared to the to the straight arm uh, strength to be able to really hold hold this tuck punch and to do it right with yeah. without your hips uh, dropping right because a lot of people do tuck punch push-ups uh, but the, their hips dropping as the set goes on at the last part yeah so they're doing you know they're just basically doing a dip that yeah. is a bit higher, yeah. Yeah, and they call it a tuck plunge push up. But for me, a tuck plunge push ups is when uh, when you can uh, really hold this this top position. Like you don't have to do a like two second pause at the top, but uh, just be be able to hold it for a half a second with the hips on the same level as the shoulders. And I think that when people skip the straight arm work and only focus on the bend arm they think that they will get the benefit because they they're extending the elbows at the top but i don't think it's it's enough for me you have to own the position first if you want to do a push-ups in it and you have to own the front lever if you want to do rows in the in this front lever so mm -hmm. what do you think about it uh yeah it's uh, it's interesting because for example i found you know uh, that in front lever for example it's not as big of a deal for so for example in front lever if someone is able to do tuck uh pull-ups tuck, the tuck rows he's gonna probably have tuck hold you know i i at least you know just i would you know really i see the row as a progression of the actual hold um because i mean it's it's different it's one is straight arm uh, the other is bent arm but just most people are uh, not able to do a row before they can hold it. The other point is many people do it with slightly bent elbows, but that's uh, that's the other thing, right? Um, in the planche, that's exactly, you know, something that I observe multiple times is basically people who are doing the top planche push-up and at the very top, when they extending the elbow, at the very top, you know, their, their hips are dropping. And I think that's the the indication of straight arm, uh, the lack of straight arm strength. Yeah. So uh, in my eyes, for example, um, I used to experiment, you know, with uh, advanced tuck, uh, push-ups, stuff like that. And uh, you know, as as I go, as I progress with the variation, it just starts. This exact compensation mechanisms occurs. So uh, in my eyes, just if you're not able to perform a proper tuck plunge push up, you know, with uh, that your hips are not dropping, you should focus more on the first of all, uh, the tuck plunge, you know, and secondly, the lean push ups. But uh, doing tuck plunge in this way will not necessarily help you in the long run because you don't have this straight arm component. Training it, you know, only, you know, focusing on a pause. Do you like, do you imagine going this way to full planche push-ups? I mean, I cannot. I, I mean, I cannot imagine someone going from this kind of like tuck, tuck planche approach and then just extending, you know, and eventually doing full planche. You know, it's going to work for like one person of people. Yeah. Um, because you, you have to take into consideration what is your limiting factor, right? And the limiting factor is a straight arm strength and you're not going to develop it uh, by doing more bend arm reps and just uh, trying to hold it a little bit at the top and your hips will always be dropping and it will never really correct itself, probably. Yes, because yeah. as the time goes on, you will get stronger in the bend arm, in the, in the pushing but there's this lack of this straight arm components uh, so i think it's 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 something to to take into consideration uh, but it really depends because some people are, are not that concerned about the, the the perfect form and they they want to uh, do tuck plunge push up this way and they are fine with it so 
Yeah, you know, and the perfect form is uh, the discussion for completely another time because I think people interpret it sometimes it, uh, you know, uh, not in a way that, for example, I would like them to interpret it. So it's not always, you know, so if the exercise technique is changing so much that it doesn't provide the same stimulus anymore, then what's the point of doing that this way? You know, you, you're not going to develop your tuck plunge straight on by working with, uh, by doing this, by doing, you know, basically bent arm, then going to the dip, because that's uh, essentially what it looks like. Uh, it, it doesn't help you. It doesn't provide enough stimulus with the straight arm. So I definitely, I agree that there, the straight arm component is necessary. And you know what, like, I think I know why this, uh, this uh, idea is present. So basically, there are some people, you know, in the community that developed their straight arm um, strength, mainly uh, by, you know, very strong bent arm. And I know people myself, you know, in Poland, uh, who, you know, took their OHP to very high number, like to, you know, at the body weight of, let's say, 80 kilos, they have like 95, so significantly more than, they, than their body weight. And these guys usually, despite doing less straight arm work, they have good plunge and everything, you know. But is it, no, I'm not going to use this word, but is it, you know, good for most people? For for 90% of people, probably not. Yeah, but uh, there's also a difference between building your raw strength or, or muscle with exercises that are suit, suited for it uh, well, like... OHP, right? Because it's simple movement pattern and you can re really yeah. overload it. But the problem is when people try to build their base, they, they raw strength with exercises that are not really best for it, like doing shitty tuck punch push-ups, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, there's, there's a difference between these approaches, but I was talking, you know, in a sense of straight arm versus bent arm and do you need straight arm? Yeah. So, um, f I, I have... Uh, opposite approach because I, I see a lot of people prioritize the bend arm uh, work so they they don't really want to do uh, a lot of uh, straight arm work for planche or front lever but they focus really on the rows and the push-ups right yeah and uh, I I think about the other way I I would rather focus more on the straight arm uh, component than on the push-ups and the rows because I I may be wrong but I think that when when you can really hold uh, the straight arm uh, position really good, uh, then it's not going to be that hard to do a push-up uh, in this position or, or row, because push-up is always going to be easier than holding this position, right? So you can really hold tuck plunge uh, really, really good, and you have some, some basic uh, pushing strength. It's not going to be a big deal to just go and, uh, and do a push-up in this position, right? Yeah, okay, but uh, how is that to... Because you mentioned that you take that you treat uh, the push-up and rows as a progression of the uh, of the hold. Or... No, not really. I, I didn't say that. Not like a progression, but... I did not understand that, yeah. Uh, but for me, uh, it's when you can really hold a position uh, comfortably for, for, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 seconds, right? Mm -hmm. It's not going to be that hard uh, then to do a push-up or a row in this position because you own this position, position re really good. And for me, it's not, not for me, I think for everyone, it's always going to be harder to to hold a, a plunge uh, really good than to do a push-up uh, yeah. in this. So let's say you have a good uh, straight arm strength uh, you can hold the position for at least 10 seconds and you have some general pushing strength. Uh, yeah. It doesn't have to be really spe specific. Then you're probably going to be able to do one, two, three reps uh, okay. of the push-up or row in this position. That's how I think about it. That's what I ob observed, right? Hey, I, I know what you mean, yeah. Yeah, and but when you go the other when, way around, when you prioritize bend arm and you are lacking the straight arm uh, strength, then yeah, it's... You can do full plunge push-ups uh, with a lot of momentum, yeah. like a lot of people do it, right? So you can see it's... The minimal it's, pause or, or not. Yeah. Yeah. Just going boom, 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 rep, 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 right? So it's 
you can see that it's uh, it's easier to do the push up but it's really hard to to own the position to to hold it uh, so that's why recently i've been i've been prioritizing the the straight arm component and i not not that worried about uh, working on the push ups specifically or, or on the front of the rows because i think as long as i, ha I have this uh, straight arm uh, strength and i have uh, general pushing and pulling exercises that uh, then when I uh, can hold certain uh, posi position, yeah. then automatically I'll be able to to do something in that position, right? It, it may not be perfect uh, at first, or especially in uh, rows, it may lack uh, uh, a room, right? Right? The, the, it's yeah. really hard to touch your body to the to the bar, but you can just then start working in it. But when you go other way, way around, when you with bender, but you don't have straight arm, then you can really do okay. do anything. Right? I think that's how yeah. I think. Uh, I wanted to because you know it's interesting. For example, because straight arm, uh, basically, if you look at let's say let's take um, straight arm uh, and planche is a good example because you know it's uh, like uh, it's ascending curve basically, right? Uh, so, in for example, do you? Can you imagine that, or did you find that there are people who, for example, can hold straddle planche straight arm, but cannot hold bent arm straddle planche? I don't know. No. Because technically, you know, technically, uh, planche is like bent arm planche has to be easier because uh, you're just you're doing same thing, but you're helping yourself, you know, with uh, other muscles. Uh, but, yeah, but I think I think it's also different uh, between doing a planche push-up and holding a bend arm planche. It might be a little bit different because when you do push-up, you, you start from the planche po position and you just have this stretch reflex, right? You have yeah. this moment to go uh, down and up, and the the holding of the of the bend arm uh, planche may be a little bit uh, different. But I think if you can hold uh straddle straight arm planche you probably be able to hold a uh, full bend arm planche because generally it's it's easier right okay. because of the le le leverages and yeah so then that makes sense you know so then <clears throat> just if you have the straight arm just like you said if you have a straight arm tuck planche then it's not going to be as hard to you know to add push-ups to it where the other way around you're going to just go into this rabbit hole of doing momentum push-ups or dropping your hips and compensating this way so yeah yeah i, I, yeah, I also you know, i have my my anecdote for for that because recently i've been really focusing on the straight arm work and i i haven't done any planche push-ups or, or pseudo planche push-ups uh, any uh, i think any horizontal pushing uh, at all uh, or maybe some some bench press one time uh, something like that yeah i saw uh, yeah. Yeah, but uh, it it was it was uh, failed failed uh, start of the mesocycle because I did too much uh, that was stupid whatever. But I have this anecdote because I really focused on the straight arm, mm -hmm. uh, and I for the longest time I I couldn't do a, a proper bend arm plan planche right. I just couldn't hold it. It was like split seconds. It, it was not very good. Uh, and now, after after really improving my straight arm uh, straight arm strength for the planche, I, I tried bend arm planche, and it's it's really easy with a good form, and I can hold it for for over ten seconds, easy, right? So okay. so that's my anecdote for it. So I don't really uh, train any pseudo planche push-ups or tuck planche push-ups or or then any horizontal pushing for that matter, right? Just just the just, I just did uh, other bend arm pushing exercises that they were not specific to the bend arm planche and the straight arm work right and now bend arm planche is easy with good form and so i think that's that's the case so that yeah. seemed to be a good combination so uh doing general <clears throat> general you know uh pushing bent arm stuff uh, progressing in that and along with that you know doing as much straight arm work as you possibly can recover from yeah it, it's uh, of course gonna depend uh, yeah on on the person because I I have uh, this post about the four components of the, the, the each calisthenic skill how I look at uh, uh, how I look uh, at it now right so 
certain pers person might have uh, enough muscle mass in the right places, but not enough raw strength, or, or some some person have a good uh, understanding of the technique, um, but not enough uh, muscle or not on, enough general strength, and it's also the joint angle specific strength. So. Uh, of course, it's a little bit complicated and depends on the person, but, but generally, uh, probably most people need more just raw strength and more muscle in the right places. And the joint angle specificity and technique um, doesn't need as, as much work. And I see a lot of people do a lot of joint angle specific, specificity and a lot of uh, technique, but not enough this, this building the, the muscles in the right places and not enough raw strength. And this was the mistake that I did for the longest time. That's why I'm not at such a good level after after many years, because I, I tried to be too specific and I, I didn't understand that those those other components are, are very important. And you don't have to go really crazy with only doing calisthenics uh, and only doing many, many specific exercises. So okay. it's of, it's often better to to develop your raw strength uh, and along side of that do this joint angle specificity, but you don't have to do do it uh, as much probably as as some people think. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's maybe I will add one thing and we can wrap this up because it's it's getting really really long. Uh, so generally, I think that. Uh, it's all, it's illogical for me if you want to do tuck planche push-ups and you mm -hmm. can't hold a tuck planche and you you won't probably get it by doing tuck planche push-ups with shitty form and hoping that one day you, it will improve. So for me it's it's really simple. First I need to own the position, hold it uh, really good, and then uh, I can do push-ups uh, in it, right, or or uh, or rows in the front level. Okay, That's how so I now at. I understand. Okay. So it's not the progression, it's yeah. just a requirement, you know, you have yeah. to hold, yeah. Okay, so I totally agree. I would never, you know, prescribe someone to do <clears throat> tuck punch push-up if this person is not able to hold straight on tuck. Exactly, yeah. but some people do it this way. I don't think it's 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 the best way to do it. But maybe there's a person that achieved... Uh, I mean, you can achieve tuck punch this way, maybe, but uh, the problem is if you can really go to the more reps with the clean form this way, right? Yeah, but, uh, you know, there are things people achieved, you know, yeah. I, um, it's not really a good thing to, to look at. You, you have to look like more generally at what works for most people because uh, I'm, I'm absolutely sure there are people who achieved, you know, full planche without doing any straight arm work, you know, it, uh, there are like very, there is like probably a minority that can do this kind of stuff, but it doesn't, you know, and I'm preparing right now, for example, a video about, I'm not going to go into details because it's going to be released in like a day. So probably tomorrow it's going to be up on, on my YouTube, <clears throat> but yeah, about, for example, leg training. Uh, in calisthenics. So <clears throat> for example, just because there are people who can, for example, have huge legs and be able to full plunge, it does not mean that you you are going to be able to do it as well. You know, yeah. it's uh, it, it's not the argument they are doing that despite despite that and not because of it. You know, and it's a huge difference. You know, people that that's what is the problem with you know anecdotal anecdotal evidence and looking at people in this community who are very strong and achieved certain things. You know, sometimes their training is not even that optimal. Uh, sorry, that's good. You know, <laughs> their training, you know, for example, if you look at the top, top uh, power lifter or someone, uh, maybe their training is not, is also like could be better for, for, for the goals. Yeah, but in, like in spite of it, they're still the best because they have the best, you know, genetics, other factors, you know, yeah. Yeah. So I think it's it's enough for today. I, I don't know if, if uh, somebody will. Hours. <laughs> I don't know if somebody will watch it to the end. Maybe we'll see. Uh, so I think that um, we we definitely uh, do another another podcast on your channel. Yeah, for and, sure. Uh, so you can 
post questions down below. Uh, tell us what what you want uh, us to talk about. We have some ideas, but we, we are open to to your uh, su yeah. su I'm also suggestions. I'm gonna do a questionnaire, some kind of you know. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna just collect certain topics, ideas. Uh, I'm gonna you know, uh, and we're gonna do a podcast on my channel as well. Yeah. Very soon. So I ho I hope uh, you like it. I hope it, it wasn't that, that bad and and that you could understand us. You you could you could understand us well. Uh, so thank you, man. And, thank and see you so you much in the, in the next one. Okay, jak to się zatrzymuje.